The Vedanta by Frithjof Schoen A Chapter from Spiritual Perspectives and Human Facts Published by World Wisdom Books and read by Leslie Kadavid for the Matheson Trust Chapter 1 Among explicit doctrines, the Vedanta stands out as one of the most direct formulations possible of what constitutes the very essence of our spiritual reality. This directness is compensated by its requirement of renunciation, or, more precisely, of total detachment, vairagya. The Vedantic perspective finds its equivalence in the great religions which regulate humanity, for truth is one. Their formulation, however, may be dependent on dogmatic perspectives which restrict their immediate intelligibility, or which make direct expressions of them difficult of access. In fact, whereas Hinduism is, as it were, made up of autonomous fractions, the monotheistic religions are organisms in which the various parts are formally bound up with the whole. Hinduism, although it is organically linked with the Upanishads, is nevertheless not reducible to the Shivaite Vedantism of Shankara, although this must be considered as the essence of the Vedanta and so of the Hindu tradition. The Vedanta of Shankara, which is here more particularly being considered, is divine and immemorial in its origin, and in no sense the creation of Shankara, who was only its great and providential spokesman. It has in view above all the mental virtues, those which converge towards perfect and permanent concentration, whereas moralities, whether Hindu or monotheist, extend the same principles to the domain of action, which is almost suppressed in the case of the wandering monk or sannyasi. Thus, calmness of mind, shama, becomes, in the case of the Muslim, for example, contentment, rida, or confidence in God, tawakkul, which in fact produces calmness of mind the Vedanta retains the alchemical essence of the virtues. This is what Ibn al-Arif also does when he seems to reject, one after another, the religious virtues. In reality, he detaches them both from the self-interested ego and from the anthropomorphic aspect of the divinity in order to keep only their essences. It is also to be noted that Hinduism also knows contentment, santosha, and confidence in God, prapatti, but the sannyasi goes beyond them. According to the Vedanta, the contemplative must become absolutely himself. According to other perspectives, such as that of the Semitic religions, man must become absolutely other than himself, or than the I, which from the point of view of pure truth amounts to exactly the same thing. In Sufism, the term huwa, he, in no way signifies that the divine aseity is conceived in an objectivized mode but solely that it is beyond the distinction between subject and object which is designated by the terms ana and anta, I, thou. The divine subject, by descending into the plane of cosmic objectivation, illuminates it by virtue of the mystery of the spirit, a ruh and sustains and also absorbs this plane by virtue of the mystery of the light, an nur The demiurgic tendency is conceived in the Vedanta 
as an objectivation, and in Sufism it is conceived as an individuation, and so in fact as a subjectivation. God being then not pure subject as in the Hindu perspective, but pure object, he, huwa, that which no subjective vision limits. This divergence lies only in the form, for it goes without saying that the subject of the Vedanta is anything but an individual determination, and that the Sufi object is anything but the effect of an ignorance. The self, Atma, is he, for it is purely objective, inasmuch as it excludes all individuation, and the he, Hua, is self, and so purely subjective, in the sense that it excludes all objectivation. The Sufi formula, la ana wa la anta, Hua, neither I nor thou, he, is thus equivalent to the formula of the Upanishads, tat tvam asi, that art thou. Where the Vedantist speaks of the unicity of the subject, or more precisely, non-duality, advaita, a Sufi will speak of the unicity of existence, that is, of reality, wahtat al-wujud. In Hindu terms, the difference is that the Vedantist insists on the aspect of chit, consciousness, and the Sufi on the aspect of sat, being. That which in man goes beyond individuality and all separateness is not only pure consciousness, but also pure existence. Asisis purifies the existential side of man and thus indirectly purifies the intellectual side. If man could confine himself to being, he would be holy by that very fact. This is what quietism believed it had understood. Atma is pure light and bliss, pure consciousness, pure subject. The notion of the subject, far from being only psychological, is before all else logical and principial, and so cannot be restricted to any particular domain. The obvious subjectivity of the faculties of sensation already proves that the pair, subject-object, does not belong solely to the realm of psychology. All the more is it true that metaphysical notions such as the witness, Sakshi, in the Vedanta, or in Sufism, the knower, Al-Aqil, with its complement, Al-Maqul, the known, or again, the divine subjectivity, Aniya, with its complement, Huwiya, the divine objectivity, have nothing whatever to do with any kind of psychology. There is nothing unrelated to this reality. Even the object, which is least in conformity with it, is still it, but objectivized by maya, the power of illusion consequent upon the infinity of the self. This is the very definition of universal objectivation. But within it one must distinguish further between two fundamental modes, one subjective and the other objective. The first mode is the following. Between the object as such and the pure and infinite subject, there stands, 
as it were, the objectivized subject. That is to say, the cognitive act through which, by analysis and synthesis, the bare object is brought back to the subject. This function of objectivizing in relation to the subject, which then, as it were, projects itself upon the objective plane, or of subjectivizing in relation to the object which is integrated in the subjective and so brought back to the divine subject, is the spirit which knows and discerns the manifested intelligence, the consciousness, which is relative and so capable in its turn of being an object of knowledge. The other fundamental mode of objectivation may be described thus. In order to realize the subject, which is sat, being, chit, knowledge or consciousness, and ananda, bliss, it is necessary to know that objects are superimposed upon the subject, and it is necessary to concentrate one's mind on the subject alone. Between the objective world, which then becomes identified with ignorance, avidya, and the subject, the self, atma, there is interposed an objectivation of the subject. This objectivation is direct and central. It is revelation, truth, grace, and therefore it is also the avatara, the guru, the doctrine, the method, the mantra. Thus the sacred formula, the mantra, symbolizes and incarnates the subject by objectivizing it, and by covering the objective world, this dark cavern of ignorance, or rather by substituting itself for it, the mantra leads the spirit lost in the labyrinth of objectivation back to the pure subject. That is why, in the most diverse traditions, the mantra and its practice japa, are referred to as recollection, the dhikr of Sufism. With the aid of the symbol of the divine name, the spirit which has gone astray and become separated recollects that it is pure consciousness, pure subject, pure self. That the real and the unreal are not different does not in any way imply either the unreality of the self or the reality of the world. To start with, the real is not non-different with respect to the unreal. It is the unreal which is non-different with respect to the real. Not, that is, inasmuch as it is unreality, but inasmuch as it is a lesser reality, the latter being nonetheless extrinsically unreal in relation to absolute reality. Maya, illusion or the divine art which expresses Atma according to indefinitely varied modes, and of which avidya, the ignorance which conceals Atma, is the purely negative aspect, proceeds mysteriously from Atma itself, in the sense that Maya is a necessary consequence of Atma's infinity. Shankaracharya expresses this by saying that Maya is without beginning. Atma is beyond the opposition of subject-object. 
One can, however, call it pure subject when one starts from the consideration of objects, which are so many superimpositions in relation to Atma. Maya is the objectivizing or manifesting tendency. The principal degrees of objectivation or manifestation are the feet, padas, of Atma, or from the standpoint of the hierarchy of microcosmic states, its envelopes, koshas, each degree of objectivation is equivalent to a more or less indirect image of Atma, an image reflected inversely. At the same time, each degree realizes an inversion in relation to the one which is above it and by which it is contained. Because the relationship of subject, objectivation, or principle manifestation is repeated from one pada or kosha to another. Thus the animic or subtle objectivation is principial in relation to the corporeal or gross objectivation. And likewise, the supraformal objectivation is principial in relation to the formal objectivation, which for its part contains both the animic and corporeal planes. However, the universal and fundamental inversion between subject and objectivation is never done away with as a result of the inversions comprised within the objectivation itself. For these are never produced under the same relationship and never under any relationship capable of nullifying that first inversion. Inversion within an inversion is therefore never inversion of the inversion. Never that is to say, a re-establishment of the normal relationship. In other words, the subordinate inversion which, within the great inversion represented by the cosmos in relation to the self, appears as if it ought to nullify the latter, since it inverts it symbolically is in its turn inverse in relation to the divine norm. An opaque body does not become transparent when painted white to compensate for its opacity, although the color white represents light or transparency, and for that reason also represents the negation of that opacity. Or again, the fact that a body is black adds nothing to its opacity. When Sufism teaches that the trees of paradise have their roots above, it would be wrong to try to grasp this idea by means of the imagination. For the relation in question, once it is translated into terrestrial forms, is expressed precisely by the terrestrial position of trees. In other words, if one were to behold the trees of paradise, a spirit endowed with the appropriate faculty of vision would accept them as being normal, exactly in the same way as the mind accepts the trees on this earth. In this order of ideas, it is instructive to note the fact that the retina of the eye receives only inverted images and that it is the mind which re-establishes the normal and objective relationship. Therefore, if formal manifestation, 
both subtle and gross, is inverse in relation to formless manifestation, this nevertheless does not cancel the inversion realized by formless manifestation in relation to non-manifestation or non-objectivation, which is the self, the subject. It is very easy to label as vague or contradictory something one cannot understand. Rationalist thinkers generally refuse to admit a truth that presents contradictory aspects and that is situated, seemingly beyond grasping, midway between two extrinsic and negative enunciations. Now, there are some realities which could not be formulated in any other way. The ray which proceeds from a light is itself light, since it illumines, but it is not the light from which it proceeded. Therefore, it is neither that light nor yet other than that light. In point of fact, it is nothing else but light, though growing ever weaker in proportion to its distance from its source. A faint glow is light for the darkness it illumines, but darkness for the light whence it emanates. Similarly, maya is both light and darkness at the same time. She is light by the very fact that she is the divine art inherent in the principle and is also identified with wisdom, Sophia, understood in precisely the same sense as is given to it in the Judeo-Christian tradition. As such, she is the mother of the Avatara. This is what Islamic esotericism designates by the terms science, ilm, and light, nur. She is light inasmuch as, being the divine art, she reveals the secrets of Atma. She is darkness inasmuch as she conceals Atma. As darkness, she is ignorance, avidya. To this ignorance there corresponds, in Islamic terminology, association, shirk, that is to say the fact of associating a superimposition with unity. In spiritual realization, the cosmic tendency of objectivation is captured by the symbol. In the natural course of its drawing away from Atma, the soul meets the objectivation. In this case, direct and not indirect, of the pure subject. The indirect objectivation is the world, with its endless diversity. And the direct objectivation is the symbol, which replaces the pure subject on the objectivized plane. Atma resides in the center of man as subject, pure and infinite, and it surrounds man as the indefinitely differentiated objectivation of the subject. The yogi, or mukta, the delivered one, perceives Atma in everything, but the man who is undelivered has to superimpose on the world the synthetic and direct image of Atma in order to eliminate the superimposition in relation to Atma which the world itself represents. A symbol is anything that serves as a direct support for spiritual realization as, for example, a mantra, or a divine name, or, in a secondary way, a graphic, pictorial, or sculptured symbol, such as a sacred image, pratika. 
the revelation of Sinai, the messianic redemption, the descent of the Quran. These are so many examples of the subjectivizing objectivation effected by the symbol, in which Atma is incarnated in Maya, and Maya expresses Atma. To say, as do the Vedantists, that Maya is an attribute of Ishvara, and that Maya expresses Ishvara and at the same time veils him, signifies clearly that the world derives from the infinity of Atma. One could also say that the world is a consequence of the absolute necessity of being. If Maya is presented as a postulate, this must not be understood in a philosophical or psychological sense as if it were a question of a hypothesis, for this postulate is necessary and consequently corresponds to an objective reality. Maya, taken as the purely negative factor of objectivation, cannot possibly be known positively. She therefore imprints herself on the intelligence as an unextended and ungraspable element. In a certain sense, Maya represents the possibility for being of not being. The all possibility must, by definition, and on pain of contradiction, include its own impossibility. It is in order not to be that being incarnates in the multitude of souls. It is in order not to be that the ocean squanders itself in myriads of flecks of foam. If the soul obtains deliverance, that is because being is. Nothing is external to absolute reality. The world is therefore a kind of internal dimension of Brahma. But Brahma is without relativity. Thus the world is a necessary aspect of the absolute necessity of Brahma. Put in another way, relativity is an aspect of the absolute. Relativity, Maya, is the Shakti of the absolute, Brahma. If the relative did not exist, the absolute would not be the absolute. The essence of the world, which is diversity, is Brahma. It might be objected that Brahma cannot be the essence of a diversity, seeing that it is non-duality. To be sure, Brahma is not the essence of the world, for, from the standpoint of the Absolute, the world does not exist. But one can say that the world, in so far as it does exist, has Brahma for its essence. Otherwise, it would possess no reality whatsoever. Diversity, for its part, is but the inverse reflection of the infinity or of the all-possibility of Brahma. Natural things are the indirect objectivations of the self. The supernatural is its direct and lightning-like objectivation. The cosmos is the total objectivation made in the image of God, which includes all other cosmic objectivations. The cosmic objectivation of the self presupposes the divine objectivation. Being, Ishwara, or Aparabrahma. 
Sufism expresses it by this formula. I was a hidden treasure and I wished to be known. Union, yoga, the subject, atma, becomes object, the veda, the dharma, so that object, the objectivized subject, man, may become the absolute subject. Deification God became man so that man might become God. Man pre-exists in God. This is the Son. And God pre-exists in man. This is the intellect. The point of contact between God and man is, objectively, Christ, and subjectively it is the purified heart. Intelligence Love Unification, Tawheed, the One, Illallah, became not, La Ilaha, in order that the not might become the One. The One became separate and multiple, the Quran, in order that the separate and multiple, the Soul, might become the One. The multiple pre-exists in the One. This is the uncreated Qur'an, the eternal Word. And the One pre-exists in the multiple. This is the heart intellect. And in the macrocosm, it is the universal Spirit. The Vedanta by Frithjof Schuon a chapter from Spiritual Perspectives and Human Facts, published by World Wisdom Books and read by Leslie Karavid for the Matheson Trust. Chapter 2 The conceptions of Ramanuja are contained in those of Shankara and are transcended by them. When Shankara sees in the localization and duration of sensory objects a direct and tangible manifestation of their unreality, he does not say, as Ramanuja seems to have believed, that they do not exist as objects, but he says that as existing objects they are unreal. Ramanuja affirms against Shankaracharya truths which the latter never denied on their own level. Ramanuja shows a tendency to put everything in a concrete form as a function of the created world, and this indeed corresponds both with the Vishnuite point of view and with the Western outlook which shares the same perspective. The antagonism between Shankara and Nagarjuna is of the same order as that which opposes Ramanuja to Shankara, with this difference, however, that if Shankara rejects the doctrine of Nagarjuna, it is because the form of the latter corresponds, independently of its real content and of the spiritual virtuality it represents, to a more restricted perspective than that of the Vedanta. When, on the other hand, Ramanuja rejects the doctrine of Shankara, it is for the opposite reason. The perspective of Shankara goes beyond that of Ramanuja, not merely in respect of its form, but in respect of its very basis. In order really to understand Nagarjuna, or the Mahayana in general, one must before everything else take account of two facts. First, that Buddhism presents itself essentially as a spiritual method, and so subordinates everything to the point of view of method. And secondly, that this method 
is essentially one of negation. From this it follows, on the one hand, that metaphysical reality is considered with reference to method, that is, as state, and not as principle, and, on the other hand, that it is conceived in negative terms, nirvana, extinction, or shunya, the void. In Buddhist wisdom, affirmation has the same meaning and function as subjectivism, and hence ignorance in Hindu wisdom. To describe nirvana or shunya in positive terms would amount, in Vedantin language, to wishing to know the pure subject, the divine consciousness, atma, on the plane of objectivation itself, hence on the plane of ignorance. When Western people refer to something as being positive, they almost always think of manifestation, of the created, hence their preference for the perspective of Ramanuja and their mistake in attributing abstractions to Shankara or to Plato. God is abstraction for the world because the world is abstraction in relation to God. It should be noted here that the word God does not and cannot admit of any restriction for the simple reason that God is all that is purely principial and that he is thus also and a fortiori beyond being. This one may not know or may deny, but one cannot deny that God is that which is supreme and therefore also that which nothing can surpass. Now it is God who is real, not the world. People often believe that the content of a statement is false to the extent that the enunciation can be attacked by dialectics. Now every statement, the content of which is not a fact that can be checked physically or rationally, that is, every transcendent truth, can be contradicted by arguments drawn from experience. Shankara never said that the inevitably human formulation of truth, bearing, for instance, on absolute consciousness, could not be attacked. He said that such formulations were intrinsically true and something that the reason alone could not verify. When the Advaitins say that consciousness has such and such a nature and that the example of deep sleep shows it, that does not at all mean that they themselves had need of this example or that they could be discomfited by a demonstration of the gaps it necessarily contains. Clearly, it is not because of a contrary aspect but because of an analogy that one has recourse to an example. Contrary aspects do exist, but they are not relevant here. If we say that compared to an opaque body, any light is like the sun, the fact that this light has neither the form, nor the dimensions, nor the matter of the sun is absolutely without significance in this connection. Moreover, if the example differed in no way from the thing to be demonstrated, it would be not an example, but the thing itself. Intellectual intuition communicates a priori the reality of the absolute. Reasoning thought infers the absolute by starting from the relative. Thus it does not proceed by intellectual intuition, though it does not inevitably exclude it. For philosophy, arguments have an absolute value. 
For intellectual intuition, their value is symbolical and provisional. Shankara did not construct a system. By this is meant an assemblage of concordant reasonings hierarchically arranged. It is true that one can always describe an orthodox doctrine as a system when comparing it to some system in nature, such as the solar system. In fact, a doctrine is in the nature of things an assemblage of ideas grouped harmoniously round a central idea from which they derive according to various dimensions. Shankara did not seek a solution of such and such a problem. He did not suffer from what he himself calls the disease of doubt. Shankara is like a colorless glass which allows the rays of light to pass through it intact, whereas Ramanuja might be compared to a colored glass which also transmits light but imparts to it a certain tint. This is to say that Ramanuja's doctrine is also inspired and not invented. Sages are instruments for the crystallization of the pure light. They are anything but inventors of systems. It is intellection that determines everything. The mode of expression is dictated by the requirements of the particular traditional form. With philosophers in the ordinary meaning of the word, the initiative comes from the human side, from mental restlessness, from doubt, from lack of contemplative quality. Their attitude is Promethean, not prophetic. God cannot change. Therefore, he cannot be the cause of a change as such. He is the cause of all things, and he is consequently the cause of what appears to us as change. But he is its cause not inasmuch as it is a change, but inasmuch as this apparent change, which for us is real, affirms an aspect of the immutable. Or again, simply to consider change as such, God is its cause only inasmuch as the change, or all change, expresses in the language of diversity the divine infinity, or all possibility. The world, inasmuch as it is subject to change, cannot have God for its cause. From the standpoint of its negative character, the world is not. On the other hand, change, insofar as it expresses infinity, not insofar as it negates immutability, must have God for its cause. And in this respect, the world exists, even though in the last analysis it is reducible to that cause itself. An effect, to the extent that it is ontologically positive, is not really distinct from its cause. It has sometimes been argued that the delivered sage, the Vidwan, having attained the state whence there is no return into the karmic chain of samsaric existences, has passed beyond our ken and can consequently no longer speak or teach. Now, the Advaitins have never denied the double nature of the Vidwan. If Christianity were not the religion of the West, and if the twofold nature of Christ were not a dogma, no doubt the same philosophers who seek for contradictions in the Vedanta would declare the two natures of Christ to be incompatible and would describe this dogma as a stumbling block. They would do the same as regards the Trinity. It is contradictory to maintain, in order to contest the reality of the absolute subject, 
that the intellective light is real only in respect of its projection on an external object, and that it thus has only a relative and extrinsic reality. A contrast can reveal the nature of something or bring out its value, but it cannot create that nature. It could not reveal a nature that did not exist. God is light in himself, and not because he illuminates our darkness. On the contrary, he illuminates the darkness because he is light in itself. He is love, not because he loves, but he loves because he is love. There is between the soul and Brahma both continuity and discontinuity at the same time, depending on the standpoint from which the relationship is viewed. Continuity from the point of view of the essential nature, which is consciousness, and discontinuity from the point of view of the actual nature, which is pure consciousness on the divine side and objectivized consciousness on the human side. Objectivized in its very cosmic root and consequently darkened, limited and divided by avidya, by ignorance. Hence it follows that the individual substance, even when empirically emptied of its objective content, is by no means freed thereby from the fundamental vice of objectivation, which can only be eliminated by knowledge. The being as such, that is to say, considered as a mode of objectivation, necessarily envisages the single consciousness from which in reality he is not distinct as external. The avatars adored God concurrently with their state of identity and on another plane, and therefore outside themselves. The great defect of the soul, the original sin, is not the accidental objectivation which causes a being to be distracted by one object or another, but rather the fundamental objectivation which makes this possible. Now, the fundamental objectivation is collective and hereditary. It belongs to the species and not to the will of the individual. Pseudo-Vedantist subjectivism, which in reality is solipsism, is incapable of taking stock of the objective homogeneity of the cosmic environment. It is Atma objectivized as Jivatma or Ahankara, which is the subject of mental objectivation. It is thus a subject already objectivized, secondary, and relative. When the individual empties his mind of all objects, he approaches Atma in a certain symbolical way, but the objectivation represented by the individual as such is not thereby abolished. Far from it. Spiritual realization is neither solipsism nor autosuggestion. Christ could say, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. This signifies that everything necessarily participates in the essential attributes of relativity. Shankaracharya used such expressions as this, I prostrate myself before Govinda, whose nature is supreme bliss. And Ramakrishna said, in the Absolute, I am not, and you are not, and God, as personal God, is not. For the Absolute is beyond all speech and thought. 
but so long as there is still exists something outside myself, I must adore Brahma within the limits of my mind as something which is outside me. Direct Analogy and Inverse Analogy In the former case, a tree reflected in water will never be anything but a tree. In the latter, the reflected tree will always be upside down. Between God and the world, between the principle and manifestation, between the uncreate and the created, there is always, but in different respects, both direct analogy and inverse analogy. Thus the ego is not only a reflection, but also a negation of the self. God can consequently be called the divine I, by analogy with what is positive, conscious, and immortal in the human eye. But he can also be called he, in opposition to the negative, ignorant, and unreal aspects of the human eye. The term the self expresses both the analogy and the opposition. To say that reality can never be attained by one who maintains the objective illusion is to forget that union depends not at all on some particular terminology but on the fusion of two distinct elements, whether we call these subject and object or something else. It amounts in any case to replacing the objective illusion which is normal since it is general, by a subjective illusion, which is abnormal and therefore far more dangerous. In order to be united to something, it is by no means necessary to start by pretending that one is not separate from it in any way or in any respect, or, in short, that one does not exist. One must not replace intellection by a facile and blind conviction. It is useless to seek to realize that I am Brahma before understanding that I am not Brahma. It is useless to seek to realize that Brahma is my true self before understanding that Brahma is outside me. It is useless to seek to realize that Brahma is pure consciousness before understanding that Brahma is the Almighty Creator. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The following hadith bears the same meaning. He who desires to meet Allah must first meet his Prophet. It is not possible to understand that the enunciation I am not Brahma is false before having understood that it is true. Similarly, it is not possible to understand that the enunciation Brahma is outside me is not exact before having understood that it is. And similarly again, it is not possible to understand that the enunciation Brahma is the Almighty Creator contains an error before having understood that it expresses a truth. If, in order to be able to speak of the self, one must have realized the self, how can one who has not realized it know that it must be realized in order to be able to speak of it. If only a sage can know what the self is because he has himself realized it, how can his disciples know he has realized it and that he alone knows what the self is? Under these conditions there would remain only absolute ignorance face to face with absolute knowledge. 
and there would be no possible contact with the self, no spiritual realization, and no difference between the intelligent man and the fool, or between truth and error. To attribute to knowledge a purely subjective and empirical background which is at the same time absolute amounts to the very negation of intellect, and consequently of intellection. It is also a negation of inspiration and of revelation. In other words, it amounts to a denial, first, of intelligence, then of its illumination by the self, and finally of the prophetic and law-giving manifestation of the self in a given world. It therefore means the destruction of tradition, for in these conditions the unicity and permanence of the Veda would remain inexplicable. Every realized being would write a new Veda and found a new religion. The Sanatana Dharma would be a concept devoid of meaning. Intellection, Inspiration, Revelation these three realities are essential for man and for the human collectivity. They are distinct from one another, but none can be reduced simply to a question of realization. The realized man can have inspirations that are, as to their production, distinct from his state of knowledge. But he could not add one syllable to the Veda. There are very many instances of this. Thus Sri Ramana Maharshi said that his stanzas, Ulladu Narpadu, or Sadvidya, came to him as if from outside. And he even described how they became fixed in his mind without the collaboration of his will. Moreover, inspirations may depend on a spiritual function, for instance, on that of a pontiff just as they may also result from a mystical degree. This is directly connected with grace of state, the grace attaching to a function, authority, infallibility, and the help of the Holy Spirit. As for revelation, it is quite clear that the most perfect spiritual realization could not bring it about although such realization is its sine qua non. As for intellection, it is an essential condition of the realization in question, for it alone can give to the human initiative its sufficient reason and its efficacy. This fundamental role of pure intelligence is an aspect of becoming what one is. Revelation is, in a certain sense, the intellection of the collectivity, or rather, it takes the place of that. For the collectivity as such, it is the only way of knowing. And it is for this reason that the avatara through whom the revelation is brought about must, in his normalizing perfection, incarnate the humanity which he both represents and illuminates. That is why the prayer of a saint is always a prayer of all and for all. To believe with certain neo-yogis that evolution will produce a superman who will differ from man as much as man differs from the animal or the animal from the vegetable is a case of not knowing what man is. Here is one more example of a pseudo-wisdom which deems itself vastly superior to the separatist religions, but which, in point of fact, shows itself more ignorant than the most elementary of catechisms. For the most elementary catechism does know what man is. It knows that by his qualities, and as an autonomous world, 
he stands opposed to the other kingdoms of nature taken together. It knows that in one particular respect, that of spiritual possibilities, not that of animal nature, the difference between a monkey and a man is infinitely greater than that between a fly and a monkey. For man alone is able to leave the world. Man alone is able to return to God. And that is the reason why he cannot in any way be surpassed by a new earthly being. Among the beings of this earth, man is the central being. This is an absolute position. There cannot be a center more central than the center, if definitions have any meaning. This neo-yogism, like other similar movements, pretends that it can add an essential value to the wisdom of our ancestors. It believes that the religions are partial truths which it is called upon to stick together after hundreds or thousands of years of waiting and to crown with its own naive little system. It is far better to believe that the earth is a disk supported by a tortoise and flanked by four elephants than to believe, in the name of evolution, in the coming of some superhuman monster. A literal interpretation of cosmological symbols is, if not positively useful, at any rate harmless. Whereas a scientific error, such as evolutionism, is neither literally nor symbolically true. The repercussions of its falsity are beyond calculation. The intellectual poverty of the neo-yogist movement provides an incontestable proof that there is no spirituality without orthodoxy. It is assuredly not by chance that all these movements are as if in league against the intelligence. Intelligence is replaced by a thinking that is feeble and vague instead of being logical and dynamic instead of being contemplative. All these movements are characterized by an affectation of detachment in regard to pure doctrine. They hate its incorruptibility, for in their eyes this purity is dogmatism. They fail to understand that truth does not deny forms from the outside, but transcends them from within. Orthodoxy includes and guarantees incalculable values which man could not possibly draw out of himself. In Sri Ramana Maharshi one meets again ancient and eternal India. The Vedantic truth, the truth of the Upanishads, is brought back to its simplest expression but without any kind of betrayal. It is the simplicity inherent in the real, not the denial of that complexity which it likewise contains, nor the artificial and quite external simplification that springs from ignorance. That spiritual function which can be described as action of presence found in the Maharshi its most rigorous expression. Sri Ramana was, as it were, the incarnation in these latter days and in the face of the modern activist fever of what is primordial and incorruptible in India. He manifested the nobility of contemplative non-action in the face of an ethic of utilitarian agitation, and he showed the implacable beauty of pure truth in the face of passions, weaknesses, and betrayals. The great question, Who am I? appears with him as a concrete expression of a reality that is lived, if one may so put it, and this authenticity gives to each word of the sage a flavor of inimitable freshness, the flavor of truth 
when it is embodied in the most immediate way. The whole Vedanta is contained in the Maharshi's question, Who am I? The answer is the inexpressible.